In this video, I will discuss the depositional systems of deep marine environments. The deep ocean is known as the least understood environment on Earth. Water overlaying oceanic crust has average depths between 4,000 and 5,000 meters. For reference, a 5,000 meter water column would be the distance from one end of Mount Vernon to the far end of Lisbon turned on its side. This depth creates pressure and darkness that make it very hard to study or conduct economically viable business in this environment. Scientists took this challenge though and began seriously investigating the deep ocean in 1966 with the Glomar Challenger. Up until this point, the scientific community only had sonar maps of the seafloor and were interested in studying the actual lithology of the abyssal plain. Known as the Deep Sea Drilling Project or DSDP, Scientists got their first look at drilled cores to see what the lithology of the deep ocean was like. The boat was equipped with directional propellers that acted more like thrusters, and they would anchor radio equipment to the seafloor to find their drilling sites accurately. This project laid the groundwork for studying the deep ocean, and these areas are now being considered for petroleum exploration as more accessible reserves are depleting. Despite the challenges presented with researching oceanic sediment, it is the largest depositional environment on Earth. Water covers 71% of the planet's surface, and about 50% of the surface is represented by the abyssal plain. Sediment that accumulates far away from the continents on the abyssal plain is known as pelagic sediment, and it has two main sources. The continental shelf through submarine fans and mass flows, and sediment that accumulates in the water column in the deep ocean. This pelagic sediment is very fine-grained and accumulates in layers at the bottom of the ocean in the abyss. The ocean is vast though, and continental shelves are not the only way sediment gets into the deep ocean. The open ocean shares a border with the aeolian environment of the atmosphere, and fine-grained dust can be blown in from the continents. This comes from wind blowing in sand from sand dunes, or volcanoes ejecting fine-grained ash into the atmosphere which circulates the planet and settles out into the oceans. Organisms in the water column are another main way the abyssal plain accumulates sediment. Forams, coccolithophores, and radiolarians mineralize hard parts, die, and sink to the bottom, making up an impressive amount of seafloor sediment. The seafloor isn't just a blanket of fine-grained sediment, though. It is filled with seamounts and volcanogenic features that can collapse, causing slumps and slides. Slumps are usually triggered by earthquakes, and scientists predict that a major collapse to the, the Hawaiian Seamount could cause massive tidal waves around the Pacific Rim. There are also transform faults all over the seafloor, but they don't really affect sediment redistribution. In addition to the seamounts, lithogenous sediment mainly comes from the continents. The sediment is carried from the continents into the deep ocean through submarine canyons. Just like above ground rivers carry sediment into their adjacent environments as deltas, submarine canyons carry sediment from the continental slope into the deep ocean. Mass flows like these are more important for the continental slope and rise topic, but it does have implications for the pelagic ocean. Referring back to the Hulstrom diagram, fine silt and clay particles stay suspended in very slow moving water. The sediment circulates to the open ocean and settles to the bottom when it reaches quiet enough water. So particles from continental mass flows travel into the deep ocean around the world and make up the biggest percentage of deposits on the seafloor. This lithogenous sediment originating from the continents is known as hemipelagic sediment, meaning it settles out of the water column in the deep ocean, but it didn't originate from there. Hemipelagic sediment accumulates at a rate of 10 to upwards of 100 millimeters in a thousand years. The ocean is capable of generating its own sediment too. The epipelagic ocean, or shallow part of the open ocean, is filled with life that dies and sinks down into the abyss. You might be thinking of whale bones and giant squids, but the skeletons of megafauna are not as consequential as other organisms. As mentioned previously, forams, coccoliths, and radiolaria make up a good amount of ocean, oceanic sedimentary rock. These microscopic animals precipitate minerals out of the water to construct their bodies. Certain microorganisms in the water column, like forams, mineralize calcium carbonate out of the water, and when they deposit in high concentrations, end up forming submarine limestone known as calcareous ooze. 
Calcareous ooze deposits at rates between three to 50 millimeters every thousand years. Coccoliths are even smaller microorganisms that mineralize silica in their bodies. And when silica is biogenic, we call it opal. When these silicate organisms accumulate, they produce silicious oozes on the seafloor or deep sea chert, which is SiO2. It was originally hypothesized that terrestrial volcanism was responsible for deep sea cherts, but scientists have since amended it to have been a biological process. The accumulation of chert throughout time lines up with periods of warmer and cooler water, which would also drive the productivity of coccoliths. The ocean temperature is an important mechanism for microorganisms. Higher temperatures cause higher productivity in their populations, and this leads to higher rates of biogenic sediment deposit geographically and historically. Silicious oozes deposit slower than calcareous oozes at rates of two to 10 millimeters per thousand years. Another mechanism of deep ocean sedimentation is based on the chemical properties of calcite and silica. These minerals have a higher capacity for saturation when water is more pressurized and when it's colder, both conditions that amplify the deeper you go in water. First, let's look at calcite. CaCO3 is in saturation in the epipelagic ocean, so forams that die will sink to and deposit as calcareous ooze above 3,000 meters of water depth. At 3,000 meters, calcium carbonate begins dissolving and deposits at slower rates. When water is deeper than 4,000 meters, calcite fully dissolves into the water, and this is known as the calcite compensation depth, or CCD. The oldest parts of the ocean floor sit between five and 6,000 meters of depth. So in the abyssal pelagic ocean, there's little to no calcareous ooze. Silicious ooze instead forms at this depth because opal's compensation depth is 6,000 meters. The floor of the ocean is also capable of producing sediments on site. Zeolites are a chemogenic deposit of iron or manganese oxide that forms either from a nodule of volcanogenic material or through material brought up from hydrothermal vents. There are two types of hydrothermal vents. They are created from magma close to the surface and cause some chemicals to pre precipitate out of the water. This is a black smoker and precipitates iron sulfide. White smokers, on the other hand, precipitate silicates of calcium and barium. These minerals grow as chimneys and are some of the only sedimentary structures in the deep ocean. The deep ocean also lacks many fossil assemblages of trace or body fossils. Granted, pelagic limestone is almost entirely composed of the body fossils of calcareous microorganisms. There are just the occasional fossilized cephalopods, fish, and aquatic reptiles and mammals. Trace fossils are even more sparse. The best example is known as zoophycos. This is a worm-like animal with its den in the center of the spiral. The radiating lines are hypothesized to be food scavenging behavior. And because food is also limited at the depths, the organisms need to scavenge efficiently before moving their burrows. Zoophycos are usually indicators of deep water, but they can also be found in nutrient poor shallow water. While the deep ocean may be extremely hard to study, people have still found creative ways to explore and divulge the secrets of such an otherworldly place. Here are the links to my pictures and my references. Thank you.